Hello. Hey, so I know that I immediately skipped a week after like, I'm gonna do this new thing and I'm gonna try not to ghost everyone. Um, all, however many of you. I know that you're not like sitting around waiting for me. Don't, don't think that I have delusions of grandeur there, but I want to be accountable and I really want to talk about these books. So getting to that is kind of why I skipped last week in addition to just like be, being kind of brain dead and just like ready for the three day weekend. With that brain dead, I was reading a little bit slower than I had planned. And I really, really wanted to talk about um, the book I'm going to talk about today Conjure Women by Afia Takora. I actually checked it out from the library and I'm a little, I should have bought it. <laughs> I probably will still buy it. One, the cover is stunning. It is one of my favorite covers of the year so far by a long shot. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And I will say that the cover is part of what drew me into the book because I love historical fiction but I don't usually read things set around slavery because they are upsetting. And it's not that I'm trying to hide from that upset or not interrogate those ideas because I don't believe in silencing those narratives. They are important. I don't believe those should be the only narratives from Black writers and I've been trying to support other narratives in that way but it's also set during reconstruction and that's kind of what got me because i haven't read a whole lot of historical fiction set during reconstruction and i was like okay this i'm really interested in and then the third thing is this idea of conjure women so we've got two protagonists uh, mabel and rue mother and daughter it's this idea that they're kind of like the wise women right of this community and what that means and so there's this hint of kind of folklore and tradition folk, uh, that I was really drawn to. There was also, all of those things kind of drew me into picking up the book, checking it out from the library, and I'm sure I will eventually buying it. Side note to the publisher, do not change this cover for the paperback. Don't touch it. This cover needs to be on the paperback. There are covers that I think greatly improved in the paperback and that's probably a whole nother conversation but shout out to Washington Black which I think you should definitely buy in paperback but this one this cover needs to stay I'm obsessed with it so getting into the actual meat of the book we it's a five act structure and that there are five parts I haven't really sat and interrogated that structure and how that structure works in the novel and what I think that structure does for the novel. I do think it works and there are definite, like, definite beats and, you know, acts of that. I'm trying not to do a hardcore theater analysis of that structure. So we're dealing with dual timelines and, and she jumps out of these timelines occasionally. But we're basically dealing with the years right before the Civil War and the years right after in this community. So it is a plantation and it is the former slaves of that plantation when we meet them. We do see them during slavery, but I was really, really drawn to the idea of this community and this independent community after slavery. And it plays with that. but. We, we open the book on this like ghostly kind of cry and our protagonist Rue like, shoots up and runs off toward this baby that she has previously delivered and there's a lot of mythology around this child because he's born with a, a call. I should know that it is a like legit childbirthing thing but there's a lot of superstition related to that especially in historical fiction and through time. So this child is called Black Eyed Bean. Rue has named him by accident because that's what she referred to him as and it just kind of stuck. So Black Eyed Bean doesn't like water and so he basically wakes this entire little village with his cries one night when his parents are trying to give him a bath. And so everything kind of like starts with the, the superstition around this child. And Rue is the healer woman of this community. She she births the children, she kind of takes care of everyone in their health, and things are starting to change. 
So a preacher, like a traveling preacher, kind of comes into town and he's been there before, but he's nomadic. So he'll come in, you know, in, in seasons and waves. And so he's come back and the community is starting to kind of gravitate toward him. And they're starting to look at Rue, whose mother was also their conjure woman with more suspicion. They're starting to act like throw accusations at her, call her a witch. And this is all exasperated when a sickness comes to the community that starts in the children. And at first, Black Eyed Bean doesn't get it. So there's this kind of hotbed of, of tensions, of changes. Amidst all of this, we're also starting to see some of the wider world changes. So this community is really isolated and we're kind of left, it's this, they're, they're living on this ruin of a plantation the house has burned down in the war and we don't really know the circum circumstances of that yet and so as we're going we we start to like go back and forth in time and we also get to see miss maybell rue's mother who was the healer of the plantation but really she was charged with kind of overseeing the population of the plantation she was in charge of you know, the birthing, but the ugly side of that, um, because she's presented right as this healer and like the mid, almost the midwife of the community. I will admit, I let myself become blinded to the, to, to the truth of that role for a little bit. Obviously you can't forever, but this book has a lot of really awful things. I'm not going to negate that. She doesn't shy away from the awful, but she does it in a very beautiful and transformative way and it never feels like we are I don't like narratives that feel voyeuristic in that pain and exploring that pain and it's not my place to say what's voyeuristic because how someone else processes their pain is how someone else processes their pain processes their pain so I don't know where I'm going with that I'm just I know that like these are all very touchy subjects and very touchy things to talk about so I recognize my white privilege in that instance. Um, anyway, okay, so Maybelle. So that's kind of the reality of where she sits in the hierarchy of this plantation. And that changes throughout. And then also we get to see the daughter of the plantation. And I do know her name, but I forgot to look up how to say it. And I am not, you know, versed on Southern Belle names. So I'm not gonna say it right now you will find out. I will say I was very nervous about her place in the story because I didn't want her to be centered. I didn't think she would be, but I just, I wasn't sure how she played a part. And I think it was done really well in terms of kind of juxtaposition, juxtaposing these worlds and both what this sorry I'm just playing with an empty pop can uh, what this historical world has has brought for everyone and what this system kind of demands what this unpunishing or this punishing corrupt system demands so so I I loved the way this moved back and forth and how we kind of got more of the complete picture as we went the tension builds through that. The ending, at, yeah, the ending ramped up. And all of a sudden I was sitting there crying, like, where did this come from? Where am I, what am I doing? The, the prose was lyrical and gorgeous. It was absolutely gorgeous. There was some imagery. There, there, there were just images. There was images of like, um, in the historical timeline, this all historical. I keep referring to the slavery time timeline as the historical timeline because the reconstruction timeline is contemporary to the timeline of the book, uh, the main narrative, I should say. Anyway, so Miss Maybell is helping a slave escape and talks about how she should become a bird. And so she flies away when she finally escape, escapes, but like no one knows really how she manages to evade capture, but they talk about her flying away and Maybelle had referenced that she needed to be like a bird. And then brief kind of spoiler for a small moment, you can skip briefly ahead. Um, 
she ends up coming back during reconstruction and in a like really brutal devastating scene she's been tarred and feathered so the way they she brings back this imagery in this kind of hope in the places you don't expect to see it and when we're supposed to have hope that kind of awfulness it's just really well done she also okay so i'll spoiler over um the, there's this imagery of like a revival tent on the burned grounds of the plantation that's just really really sat with me they're just these moments with that i also a kind of adored the exploration of thought between, you know, this, this conjure women mentality and this religious mentality. And obviously these people have always had religion in their lives in some way, they've been aware, but it's just like them having ownership of that religion and those beliefs and forming their own community. It, it's, just, it's just really interesting. Anytime you kind of put up old world ideas with more new world ideas, I find that fascinating. In terms of the, the Civil War part, it was really interesting to me because, and I keep saying interesting, and um, again, this was all on the home front, so to speak. And so we talk, they talk about like the fear that was kind of instilled in, in both the women, so to speak, at home and the slaves in relation to the Northern Army. And not all of that was unfounded. Obviously, they talk about, you know, a lot of the slash and burn kind of things that went on. But it was interesting in just like the fear that was instilled and for what. I also recently just finished a reread, slight, slight tangent that's not that will come a background, I promise, of Ghostland by Colin Dickey where he talks about hauntings in America and he does call to account a lot and that I respect him for the fact that oftentimes I just realized that my chair sorry he does call to account that we have this history of hauntings and historical hauntings but we are really unwilling to interrogate the parts of the history that are probably the most haunted in regards to slavery and he explores kind of the the actual hauntings and myths that have come up around that and the lack thereof but also kind of the cultural the way hauntings were used and one of that being the emergence of the kkk so she never says hey look the kkk is here now but she has the kkk start to appear on the perimeter of this world and this community um in the in the woods and so these you know white southerners are just terrorizing this community and but it doesn't start out that way so that's where the kind of heartbreaking right like this is a community that we think has their independence and control of themselves <coughs> excuse me and there's a whole backstory into how they've been kind of left alone as well that is definitely played out in the book. But it's just exploring so much in really lush readable prose. I know like I took a little bit longer with it because I couldn't focus on anything, <laughs> but it still really resonated with me and I really adored it. It's gonna give me a lot to think about. I've been babbling about this for a bit. I've gone on some tangents. I've had some awkward ex trying to explain myself. I just really liked this book. So I definitely think you should read it. That's all. Okay, I'm gonna go.